Good afternoon. We are pleased to have you join us today for the conclusion of our five-part Reopen Strong webinar series hosted by Digital Promises League of Innovative Schools. The League of Innovative Schools is Digital Promises flagship, excuse me, flagship initiative and over the past 10 years have grown into a robust and dynamic network of 114 public school districts in 34 states representing over 3.5 million students. League members are committed to working together to improve student outcomes and solve challenges facing K-12 schools through an innovative strategies, learning technology, and research. The League of Innovative School works to validate, champion, and scale innovative learning opportunities to advance equity and excellence for all learners. Today, we are going to lean into a discussion on digital, digital privacy, equity, and interoperability. As school districts implement another year of hybrid and distance learning, leaders are facing increased complexities in managing student data privacy and using data to identify and address systematic inequities. In this webinar, district leaders will share key policies and practices in protecting student data privacy as students and teachers are increasing their use of technology. We will hear what lessons they've learned and priorities for the school year. For the per first part of this webinar, Project Unicorn, a national initiative powered by a coalition of organizations representing stakeholders across the education sector, will share their work to optimize and radicalize educational data with interoperability. We will also learn about their latest resource to help schools and districts improve their data and operability and to raise awareness on the importance of interoperability to understanding all students' pathways to success. I am your co-host, Dwayne McClary, Director of the League of Innovative Schools, and I would like to introduce uh, my co-host and good friend, Ms. Ashley Campbell. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you, Dwayne, for that warm welcome. As Dwayne mentioned, my name is Ashley Campbell, and I am the owner and managing partner of Foresight Consulting Group. Thank you all for joining us this evening. The first segment of this webinar will focus on laying the foundation for data interoperability, privacy, and sorry, data interoperability, my apologies, everyone, data interoperability and privacy. We will then segue into case studies examining data privacy, equity, and interoperability. The second segment of today's webinar will provide insight into Digital Promises Data Ready Playbook and the Data Equity Cohort. We will then close out with the Data Equity Interoperability Case Study and a panel discussion. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. All attendees will be on mute without talking capabilities. Please input all questions for the panelists in the Q&A. And most importantly, if you hear or see something that you agree with, please feel free to show your support and add your comments in the comment area. With that being said, I'll turn it back over to you, Duane. Great, thank you, Ashley. We have a wealth of knowledge and expertise uh, represented for this, today's webinar. I'm super excited. As you can see, we have uh, a few folks that we're gonna introduce shortly, but to get started, we're now going to kick off um, our talk with uh, Ms. Erin Moat from Project Unicorn. Welcome, Eric, and another good friend of mine. Hi, Duane. Thanks so much for having me. And I want to thank uh, the League of Innovative Schools uh, and Digital Promise for not only hosting this webinar, but really their national leadership around these issues, particularly uh, working with schools. And I'm excited for uh, folks to see the Data Ready Playbook and hear about the data equity work today. It really is in the field that we see interoperability come to life through different initiatives that help us understand where students are at, where they need to go, and how we can help them grow through data-informed decision-making. Yes. I'm so excited at Project Unicorn to lead this coalition of organizations, 16 different organizations spanning everyone from Digital Promise to DQC to CCSSO to COSIN, who are really committed to working to address data interoperability challenges in K-12 education. You can find more about uh, data interoperability and the initiative at projectunicorn.org. So you hear this word data interoperability a lot, uh, but what does it actually mean? And so I think, you know, my teacher self always likes to put up the actual 
textbook definition, but I also think it's helpful to have the translation of this definition into how we think about it in our real life and actually how we think about it when you hear these case studies and these stories today. So I think of data interoperability as the pipes, uh, the things that transport hot water, for example, to when you want that hot shower. The hot shower, the data dashboards, the initiatives that you're going to hear about today. But sometimes we don't necessarily think about when we get in that hot shower, oh, thank gosh for those pipes. Just like when we see those dashboards or when we see um, those new initiatives, we don't say, thank gosh for data interoperability. And so when you're hearing about these stories today, you're hearing about a bunch of hot showers, the results of what happens when you can have data interoperability and data modernization exist in your school district. But they wouldn't be possible without those pipes. And it's really important when we're thinking about interoperability to also understand that that means enhanced data privacy and data security for our data as it moves between applications. Data privacy and interoperability are not at odds. Interoperability and data equity are not at odds. Interoperability is the ability for us to get that data in a secure way through the pipes to those hot showers. And so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19 in particular, as we're focused on this theme of reopening strong and how data interoperability really helped some schools and districts tackle challenges that frankly were unseen and were unpredictable. What an enormous challenge that folks had coming in to the pandemic and the almost overnight switch that many schools and districts needed to make to online or digital environments. And I think what's great about educators is that when faced with challenges, they respond with innovation, creativity, and really thinking about coming together. And that's really, I think, what we're seeing when we look at some of the work that's happened with interoperability in the wake of COVID-19. I would point out the Because They Were Ready series that Project Unicorn wrote, profiling some districts around the work they had done prior to the pandemic that prepared them to rapidly respond. And so as you're thinking about the work of data interoperability, data privacy, and data equity, thinking about it as doing maintenance on your pipes, making sure that your pipes are ready for when that storm comes, they can get the water out of the basement, for example, making sure that your pipes are ready for when you wanna have your six family members all over to take hot showers at once. Doing that work on the pipes, making sure that the pipes are clean, they're well-maintained, they're not leaking, means that you can have that hot shower, those hot showers when you want them. Or when I was a teacher, uh, when I got home from those uh, field trips at the Bronx Zoo all day. There's nothing more that I wanted than that hot shower. And so I want to just call out, I think, three themes you're going to hear today as you hear folks describe those hot showers um, and also some of the work they did on the pipes. Really thinking about what it means to be connected. And I mean that not just in terms of connected through digital technology, but what does it mean to be connected into your community so that when you have data, you can take action? And that means going beyond just, can my students get online and do they have access to technology? But do they understand, is this technology usable? Is it frankly accessible to our students with disabilities and our L learners? That's really that equity lens. Can everyone access the tools and software that we're using? You're gonna hear some great stories about meeting the moment today. And then finally, if there's one thing you hear other than the hot showers uh, that you're gonna remember from this webinar, I think that you'll remember that communication is the lifeblood here for our district leaders. That every single use case, every single story you're gonna hear, whether it's in because they were ready or today on this webinar, it's about how do we communicate better? How do we communicate to our teachers? How do we communicate to our students? And how do we communicate to our families? And really, I think if there's anything we are learning um, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, besides the massive inequality that we have in our school systems, is that we need to do a better job of engaging, involving, and communicating with all those folks in our communities who are here every day to support students. 
I'm absolutely thrilled to tell you a little bit about some of the resources that are available to you. Um, and that uh, happens when we actually empower folks across the spectrum. So at Project Unicorn, we have tools and resources to empower students, families, teachers, ed tech vendors, state teams, and district teams. And really the first step in unlocking those resources is signing the Project Unicorn Pledge. And once you sign that pledge, you're not only signaling that you prioritize data interoperability, you want to work on those pipes and improve and get more of those hot showers, but also that you are a leader in the space. And when you sign that pledge, you get access to a ton of resources. Dwayne mentioned some of those. One is free technical assistance. I mean, yes, free technical assistance from experts, from technologists, from enterprise architects who help schools and districts across the country modernize their architecture, think about what they're writing in procurements, and really think about their technology as an ecosystem. You also have access to over $750 in scholarships for folks on your team who, get that, who can get that money to travel to conferences or to participate in virtual convenings in order to build their knowledge base and capacity. And finally, and most importantly, you're part of a community a community of over 600 districts, over 200 ed tech vendors, and many of the folks on this call who are there to support you as you begin this data interoperability journey. I'm so pleased to cede some of my time, hopefully to practitioners' stories, and to also wanna end by saying thank you and expressing gratitude to the folks in the field, the folks who are listening, who are serving our students every day and making sure that the educational experience that they get is the very best that we can offer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Erin. Thank you so much. And guys, remember to learn more about this projectunicorn.org. And thank you, Erin, for all of your great leadership in this work. And uh, I think we're done, Ashley. I mean, she's wrapped it up for us. <laughs> I mean, who can come after Aaron? But we have an amazing amount of wealth and expertise on this webinar tonight. Yes, yes. Up next, we have our good friends from Oakland Unified. Ms. Kylie Nevis will be joining us to talk a little bit about uh, what they're doing to close the digital divide in Oakland. So Kylie is the lead for devices and operations. Welcome, Kylie. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much so much for having me. Um, so we're going to look at closing the digital divide in Oakland um, and how data interoperability helped do this. So Oakland Undivided is actually a citywide campaign, but for this uh, presentation, I'll be looking at Oakland Unified. So uh, let's look at the problem that we were faced with. So obviously the global pandemic exacerbated the digital divide in Oakland. It existed before, but now it was glaring. Uh, so you know, 50,000 students in Oakland and about 75% free and reduced lunch. So uh, Oakland Unified itself accounts for two thirds of the city's public school students. And so at the very beginning of the pandemic, we found that 12% of our low income students had sufficient home technology. That means that a lot of students did not. Um, and that was just not, so that just wasn't gonna work. <laughs> so the solution, was that in the first year, so we started Oakland Undivided, this campaign, we raised $13 million and we bought 25,000 Chromebooks, over 11,000 hotspots with two years of service. And we put in some money for uh, culturally, culturally responsive uh, tech support. So by the end of year one, we actually reached 98% of our students. And that was through a tech check survey that was Salesforce based. And they um, indicated a demonstrated need. They didn't have a computer, they had a shared computer, or they didn't have access to the internet, or they were only accessing the internet on their phone. Uh, so that would give them a device basically. And then those devices were sent to schools and we had a site-based distribution. And so, data was behind all of this <laughs> and most importantly it was student data and that needs to be protected so the tech tech survey was available in six languages that was um, equity focused but we you know we collected directory information but we also collected a lot of sensitive data and that included self-reported low income status such as free and reduced lunch they could say no or decline to state as well, but that was used to prioritize our most at-risk population. Also IEP status, because those students were provided a 14-inch touchscreen device uh, per their IEP. 
So we uh, signed a California standard data privacy agreement version two. This is usually used for software, but we, uh, we use it for this campaign to protect student data privacy. So Oakland Unified, um, you know, really took a strong commitment and they really wanted 100% of students to have home technology access. So Kyla uh, johnson Trammell, our superintendent, the Board of Education put everything behind it. They uh, dumped their own resources into it. We loaned 26,000 of our own computers from the classroom <laughs> out. Uh, we created data dashboards. We uh, enhanced our ARIES so that we could track, check in, check out data and intervention. Most importantly, we created this tech equity and access team. So that included our, um, you know, ELMA, so which is our newcomers in English language learner department, uh, case managers for foster and unhoused youth, special ed, just a range of, of folks across the district to make sure that we were reaching the hard to reach students. And then we developed our own site capacity to do distribution. All right, so we have this massive tech check <laughs> and this is a Salesforce space, and then we have our ARIES. So basically, we uh, would take the ARIES uh, or the Salesforce data, and every week we would put them into Tableau and link them to our enrollment data so that we could see who had completed the tech check and who had not, right? And so we had this available for all of our, um, our tech leads to be able to see who they needed to reach out to. So the orange on this graphic is the students that did not complete the tech check. So that means when, if you're a certain school, you could actually click into it and you could see the student list, you could see the teacher, and you could see who they, who you needed to reach out to. But the big question was, does everybody in that orange bar actually need home access? And who are the hard to reach students in that? Um, and that goes for the district and for every school. So next slide. All right, so our strategy then was to look at more than just the tech check. So first, was the tech check? So did they complete it? Yes. If they did complete it, did they have a device? If not, did we give them one, right? So did we have that checkout data in Aries to say that we gave them either a loaner or we gave them an Oakland undivided permanent, de permanent device, right? So did they have something? Uh, and that it also goes for the hotspots, right? And then if they didn't complete the survey, well, what other data could we use? All right, so we looked at Google. So we are a Google for Education district. We looked at, were they signing into Classroom? Were they signing into their email account? Were they accessing materials? We use Clever. So we use Clever for our EdTech apps. Were they accessing uh, Clever and on what devices? You know, so you could actually track the device that they were using. So if you're only using their phone, we made an outreach to those students. And then we look at attendance and GPA. So we pulled that from Aries. So a lot of data going back and forth and we created this dashboard. So this is a tech access dashboard. The first page you come up to is the summary. And you can see a lot of blue because this is the end of the, like kind of mid going towards the end of the year. But um, the blue means that they actually have access. So they have both a computer and internet. Um, you can see on the sides, um, like red and orange, that means that we still have work to do in that school. You could filter by school, and then we could filter by these uh, student groups. Um, some of these filters were only available in the aggregate, like free and reduced lunch, they're highly sensitive. But other ones like ethnicity, we could actually do some more equity-minded outreach um, to those students. So in terms of the equity gap, um, we looked at African-American and Latino. Um, this is a large population of Oakland. So Oakland's average in terms of having both was 96.6% by the end. Um, and you'll see that we actually got the African-American and Latinx up to 96 and 97%. So we did a lot of work in terms of reaching those populations. And the next slide will show you how we did it. So it looks like a lot, <laughs> but all right. That basically, this takes that flow chart and you know, makes it more accessible. So um, what you don't see on the left-hand side is all the student information. We kind of blocked that up just for student data privacy. But what you will see is um, we looked at the tech check and if we saw that they had a tech check and we could also see that they had devices checked out. If they didn't have a tech check, let's say in that column, then we could actually see if they were um, logging in 
or we have an intervention. So like, for example, um, if you go one, two, three, four down, you can see that we, uh, we didn't have a tech check for them. We checked out a Chromebook for them. Um, and because we didn't have any more information, we reached out to them and we did a home visit and found out that they needed internet. Um, so a lot of intervention, and I'll go into more intervention in the next slide, but this is how we combine the data. So when it came to intervention, this was how we reached those hard to reach. So when we found that they needed both, okay, well, then we needed to make sure that we were reaching those hard to reach students because a lot of them were facing challenges. We're basically asking a family that doesn't have digital access to fill out a digital survey, right? There's a lot of, you know, a lot of cold calling, a lot of, you know, working with teachers, right? Working with that tech equity and access team. So when you saw it need both, we would contact them. And if we couldn't contact them, which was very often, we would do home visits or we would have uh, the teacher reach out to that student. And this was imperative for getting to 98%. Where we are right now is a 2% gap. And this is what we're trying to close now in phase two of Oakland Uninvited as well as reaching out to the new incoming students. So just in summary, we had six metrics. We had the tech check survey from Salesforce. We had our device checkout in Aries. We had academic performance data, GPA and attendance. We had Google and Clever for our ed tech access data. At four systems, <laughs> Salesforce, Clever, Google, and Aries, and then two dashboards. So uh, a lot of data interoperability, but I feel like it went a long way to making sure that we were closing the digital divide in Oakland, and we continue to do so this year. Wow. Data equity and data interoperability in action. Like this is doing right by students. <laughs> Thank you, Kylie. This is awesome. And I hope this is a wealth of knowledge for some folks that are listening out there and, and we should definitely connect to learn more about what's going on out there in Oakland. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, great. So Ashley, I'm gonna turn it over to you because I think you have some great information to share about uh, the data equity cohort here at Digital Promise. Yes, thanks, Duane. Um, So with that being said, um, the data equity cohort is an amazing, absolutely amazing opportunity where we're bringing 15 districts from across the nation together to focus specifically on data equity and data interoperability. So let's start by seeing what is data equity. Data equity is an active process that involves applying an equity lens and equity mindset throughout the data life cycle. It strives to acknowledge, understand, and address educational inequities. Um, it's truly meant to address data inequities and practic practitioners of data equity specifically apply careful considerations to planning around the ways in which data is collected, analyzed, interpreted, shared and considers the stakeholders before, during and after the decision making process. So as depicted on the scene on the screen, you can see that the data life cycle with regard to data equity is an active process. So it's not passive data. Um, our districts really become proponents of looking at systems and structures within their school district to address data interoperability and by nature address data equity. And so with that in mind, I would like to introduce one of Digital Promises data equity cohort members, um, Matt Highfield and Patrick McCreary. <laughs> from Beaverton School District. Thank you very much, Ashley. And you got my name just great. Yes, that was my goal for this evening. <laughs> nice job. So Matt, Matt and I are excited to be able to work with you today. And I think Matt, you're gonna start us off. I am gonna start us off. First off, uh, I'd like to thank everyone who's listening to this webinar because data equity and interoperability and equity issues are just so important. And um, as Dwayne said, you know, the pandemic has magn mag definitely magnified that. And I also wanted to thank Oakland for, for all that they've done. I mean, that was an impressive dashboard and they really did 
and are continuing to do a lot of work. And it shows the power of, of data when, when used properly, because in the end, we want our students to have access. So um, thanks, thanks to Oakland. So a few framing statistics and observations. There we go. Uh, these statistics probably aren't all that new to all of you. Uh, the, one that, the one that jumps out at me before the pandemic is 75, the middle one, 75% of school systems nationwide did not have any strategies for providing connectivity at home and after school. And I, I think obviously the pandemic has changed that and schools have had to pivot. Uh, and a lot of schools have rolled out computers and access plans um, as, as quickly as they could. In our school district, Beaverton, we've been working on connectivity issues for quite some time and looking at, you know, looking at student surveys. Um, we happen to have Canvas as an LMS, looking at, at connectivity issues, looking at our hotspot usage, um, our overall network usage. So we, we have a number of data points that we were using to assess connectivity, but we're pretty confident in saying with our hotspot program and our outreach that um, we have um, reached um, the vast majority of our students. But uh, what we wanted to talk about today a little bit is um, after, after that connectivity piece, after you feel relatively comfortable, I mean, there's always work to do, there's always new students and new challenges, but, but then what? Um, we wanted to highlight uh, what happened to us during the pandemic, some of the things that we did, and then some of the things we are considering uh, working on in the future that we're currently working on to address, address opportunity gaps and uh, perhaps um, systemic bias. So uh, first, the next slide would be great. So as soon as the pandemic hit, our district was in a pretty good position to get Chromebooks out. Our secondary students all had Chromebooks already, and we worked to get iPads and Chromebooks out to our elementary students. And, you know, they checked them out outside um, in an open air area masked at, at the schools. Uh, what we found uh, pretty quickly though, is that just because a student had a computer and connectivity or hotspot, it didn't mean that they were accessing what we wanted them to access. And we, we started uh, assessing our, our data. Um, first off, students and families were calling at the school saying, my computer doesn't work. I don't, know how, I don't know how to access the online curriculum. That was one, that was one data point. And then we could see you know, some hotspots weren't in full use. Um, and some classrooms uh, uh, in Canvas, students weren't being able to access. So we knew that students were having problems. So we immediately, our IT department immediately set up a student help desk. And that was to help both students and their parents, especially parents of very young children, uh, understand the technology. And, you know, we, we hadn't budgeted for a help desk, a call and help desk. And because normally when people have technology problems, they go to the school and talk to the teacher or the tech person at the school, but we didn't have, we didn't have that with COVID. And we immediately realized that our language support was insufficient. And so we, we talked with our multilingual department and you know, shifted personnel and sort of made sure we had our uh, help desk man in, in multiple languages uh, with translations. And that, that made a big difference. We could, we could see, um, you know, access increase. And sometimes it was simple, uh, simple instructions to get students connected and working with, working with their platforms. And sometimes it's a little bit more complex. So I'm gonna put um, a link in the chat if you're interested on, uh, on what we did with that student help desk. But another, uh, another initiative that we, we tried during the pandemic, go to the next slide, is we had uh, some family outreach projects because 
we realized that, you know, addressing the whole family was critically important. And how, how we did that is, you know, we gathered data from school counselors, uh, but we also knew where, um, where our apartment complexes were, where there, a, lot, a lot more people were having connectivity issues. And um, we, knew, um, we knew where our hotspots were located. We knew different, um, you know, uh, grades that were coming in and assessments or assessments not being turned in. So we took all that data and during COVID, we knew that we couldn't meet inside. Normally we, you know, in, invite people to school for a tech night, uh, but we decided to go to the apartment complexes. And so that's what we did. We, uh, it, it took some groundwork. We had to talk with apartment managers, <laughs> not, not all apartment managers necessarily wanted to you know, have, have people you know, at their complexes, but we, we found appropriate apartment complexes and set up tents and, and taught, you know, invited. And often it was those personal phone calls, just like what was going on um, in Oakland. Uh, it's those personal phone calls and connections, uh, like, like Kylie was mentioning, that were critically important. So um, that apartment, out, outreach project. Here's, here's an example of the data gathering that we did. One thing that's been really helpful for me personally is to see data geographically uh, represented in our district. So here's just a portion of our district and you can see hotspot um, concentrations and um, apartment complexes, failure rates at the high school and the middle school we put those all on a map to see where the key points were and see where you know appropriate out, outreach spots were. So we didn't necessarily have a um, a, cl a clear dash um, or a really nice dashboard like Oakland did, but we, we were taking all these data points. We also wanted to look at languages across our district. We have almost a hundred different languages represented in the Beaverton School District. And getting tech help. I mean, Kylie mentioned something like culturally responsive tech support. And that's the first time I've ever heard that term, Kylie, but it should be used a lot more, right? And so we really need to, we need to partner with our multilingual department. And this is an ex another example um, using um, geographic data where we could locate where certain languages were spoken in our district. And that would help us determine um, what type of interpreters we might need or language software, for example, to meet the needs um, when we're inter interfacing with families and students. So those, those are two, um, two initiatives that we were working on during COVID, but um, we, have, we have a lot more that we're working on and I'm gonna turn it over to Pat to talk about some of the things we're currently thinking about and some of the things we'd perhaps like to take on in the future. Yep, thank you so much, Matt. So using our data to determine where, um, where our access gaps are is one thing. One of the things that I get to do in my role serving in our Office of Equity and Inclusion is make sure that once our students have that access, how do we make sure that we as a district are ensuring that they're getting the best that we have to offer um, with regard to uh, ensuring that all students have that same equity? To, to add on to what Matt said about a little bit about our demographics, we're a district of about 40,000 students um, in a community just outside of Portland, Oregon, uh, what has historically been a suburban community, but is uh, quickly becoming its own almost urban area. Um, 40,000 students, as Matt said, we have about 100 languages. We're proudly and beautifully diverse with 54% of our student population uh, identifying with the global majority. And yet, like many districts around the country, we have a, an educational staff of about 5,000 that identifies as 86% white. And so we have a gap of representation that we are constantly working on um, both uh, mitigating, so we're trying to both grow our own educators and diversify our workforce, and in the meantime as well, work with our staff on ensuring that they have an understanding of their own potential implicit biases, implicit um, or implicit um, 
areas of implicit bias that might be impacting our kids. So getting the technology into the students' hands was one thing, and then helping our teachers know how to work with students to use it effectively without the teacher's own bias uh, getting in there is another. And so that's where my role comes in. I get to work with a lot of our staff and especially our district leadership to help um, develop professional development around um, being able to better identify those areas where our own uh, implicit associations might be impacting our work. And so that's also helping us in partnership with our technology, um, our folks who work in technology, that helps us then figure out how we can use those two things, both, both the personal kind of reflective transformational change in our, in our practice and our efforts to use data and use technology um, to better uh, mitigate some of those other equity gaps. We're hoping that that will um, bring us together uh, or bring our efforts together. And so one of the projects that we're actually going to focus on within our cohort, one of the areas of focus, is around the idea of supplemental funding. So if you want to switch to the next slide, we are going to um, use data that exists in various different places. Matt, Matt has actually done a great job of kind of digging for this data in our district. And we found that in our district, not only do we have wonderful linguistic, racial, cultural diversity, we also have an economic diversity that is incredibly visible in our district. We have one of the highest socioeconomic um, zip codes in the state of Oregon. We also, as a district, have uh, one of the highest, if not the highest, rates of houselessness for students, the greatest number of houseless students. So we are trying to bridge that economic gap. And one of the places where we see that is in a supplemental funding structure that allows for uh, PTOs in our schools to have incredible disparities. We have some schools that in a single event can raise um, six figures uh, to support their school, and we have other schools that after a year of fundraising efforts have uh, maybe four figures, uh, if that. And so one of the things we're going to look at is spending uh, trends that we have data for that we so we can identify where those areas of wealth and need are in an effort to hopefully bridge that gap by creating systems and structures to help uh, more equitably distribute any supplemental funding that comes into uh, our district. And so some of the ways that we're doing that, we're looking at PTO dollars spent on technology by schools, spent on books by schools. We have information from our district librarians that we can uh, get. We have uh, information about parent volunteer hours. So we can see where there is more active volunteering, where parents have the ability to do that versus schools where they might not have uh, that degree of, of availability. Um, after school enrichment opportunities, our schools, particularly at our elementary schools, you see a great disparity there in terms of the number of opportunities offered. Oftentimes we have more opportunities offered at our schools where the students may not necessarily need them uh, versus our schools where, the, where after school opportunities would be beneficial for um, caretaking of the students while the parents are working. Um, we also have transportation issues to um, allow for those after school activities. So many of our schools are able to support uh, the, the uh, funding of transportation where some aren't, and that is the determining factor of whether students can participate. Um, we have different uh, percentages of students who identify with the global majority at our different schools. And so when, when we look at data uh, and how that disaggregates, we do tend to see some disparities there um, or disproportionate uh, impacts rather. And then also we, we do have schools, we have, uh, I forget the exact number of our elementary schools that are identified as Title I schools, but we do have notable differences in, in the resources and um, extra opportunities that students have at those schools. And then as Matt showed you on one of the heat maps, we do have different uh, data that shows different levels of connectivity. Um, just for uh, in the spirit of sharing, we wanted to share some of the resources that have been guiding our work. I'm going to give credit to Matt. I get to read this slide, but Matt really compiled all those because he's been helping lead the work in our district. And so we're excited to be working as a cohort on this. Um, we look forward to being able to report some differences later on. And uh, thank you for giving us time today. Thank you, Pat and Matt, for some really practical um, examples of how you incorporated data equity throughout your district from the Help Center 
to ensuring that there was a plethora of representations around your student demographics, whether it was the language um, barrier and making sure that that was mitigated. So thank you for those practical steps. I just want to note if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A feature. And with that being said, I am going to go ahead and introduce um, Pete Helfers. Pete, did I say your last name right? You got it. <laughs> All right, Pete Helfers from Journey School District 56. And Pete is a member, well, his school district is a member of the League of Innovative Schools. So to you, Pete. Well, thank you very much, Ashley. And thank you, Duane and, and the League. And, and thanks everybody for, um, I'm sitting here, you know, learning uh, as we're going about all the processes that everybody else has gone through uh, in this, you know, last 18 months and, and before, and will continue to, to do as we move forward. And I, I just feel so fortunate to be surrounded by, uh, you know, so many great educators and also to be a part of the league to be able to collaborate with so many wonderful people who are, you know, thinking about all these things. And also people we can go to for for resources and for ideas and for problem solving. So um, I'm I'm just really grateful to be here. Um, you know a little bit about Gurney. Uh, we are a member of the League of Innovative Schools and have been for a number of years. We found that it has been you know truly one of the greatest uh, you know collaborative groups that we could imagine being a part of. Um, a little bit about Gurney, we are suburban Chicago. We're a much, much smaller district than those that you've heard from so far. Uh, we're about 2000 students, uh, four schools. Um, our demographics look like pretty much most of America right now. We, uh, like some of the others, we're a predominantly suburban district. Um, and now we've seen that, uh, you know, um, urban life has moved farther and farther out of the city and, and into what was once suburban communities and has brought, you know, um, new ways uh, for all of us to think in terms of how do we uh, deal with the issues that come up, you know, increased poverty, um, increased, uh, you know, needs in ways that, you know, many of us were not accustomed to just a, just in a few short years ago. Um, so it's, you know, just a little bit about, about us in terms of a district, the, I, I tried to keep it very simple on our, on our slide. We really had one major concern that we were looking to resolve over the past, you know, the course of the past year. And one that I think many districts were also working through. And interestingly, in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of a time when we were, um, you know, relying on technology a lot more than, uh, you know, we had in the past and many districts who hadn't been relying on it nearly enough, or in, especially as we heard about, you know, uh, inequity of, of devices and inequity of access, et cetera. But we were really trying to solve this issue of student data privacy. We knew there were federal laws. We knew there were state laws and laws that were getting more restrictive as time was going on. As a matter of fact, a, a, um, you know, we had a July 1st deadline for getting you know, caught up in our state on all of the uh, responsibilities that we had to manage student data appropriately. And, you know, we obviously we know other states have, you know, similar laws in, in place or will have similar laws in place. And we thought, you know, some of the steps that we took in terms of, you know, getting ourselves compliant, but also more than just getting ourselves compliant, doing what we believed was right uh, by student data. Um, interestingly, as we started down this road of trying to solve this, um, you know, the um, requirements of the laws, every time somebody talked about how restrictive it was or how challenging this was or what a you know big pain this was i had to come back and say okay but you, you have to see that this is right right i mean if this were your child and their data you would want their data protected you know correct and you know nobody ever came back to me and said you know oh you know oh i don't care about my students data or my kids data everybody said well yeah you have a great point there and really that's what made, you know, even though this is a tremendously large problem to solve, especially, you know, for those of us who have been in the, you know, device and um, access world for a long time, 
you know, for some time, this was a wild, wild west in, in computer, or I'm sorry, in education technology, where people used to say, oh, there's an app for that. Let's just try that app or try this app. And, and um, that was really kind of the way that our district was used to operating. It was very much a grassroots organization where if someone said, hey, I want to try this app, we gave them as much freedom to do so as possible because we felt like that was going to increase their uh, engagement in the devices and increase student engagement in learning, et cetera. And so now we're coming into a time where we're saying, oh, okay, maybe that wasn't you know, the best idea to keep everything so wide open and free. Maybe instead it's time to start monitoring this better. So at the same time that state and federal laws were getting more uh, restrictive, I think there was also a change of heart among many people of saying, okay, we really need to take a, a much, much closer look at how indeed we're, you know, using student data, how our vendors are using state student data, and how we're uh, doing our best to protect that in, in all those situations. So, so the first thing we really needed to do is to identify the right people to help us solve that, that you know, problem. How do we, you know, um, both identify what we need to do and how do we go about, you know, getting the right people in the room? How do we go about answering all the right questions that the laws require? Um, for us, that really involved myself. Um, I work more on the instruction side in our district and also our technology director who works more on the infrastructure side of our district. But the other approach that we took was reaching out to, you know, both surrounding districts that we knew from other collaboratives and our neighboring districts and saying, okay, we're all kind of in this together. We all have to, you know, get uh, compliant at the same time and in the same way. How are you approaching it? And we had several meetings um, with our local, uh, both our local districts and other districts around the state and said, you know, what can we learn from each other? Um, we also, you know, in Illinois happen to have a great cohort um, of folks in, in student data privacy who were fabulous about sharing their resources, sharing the help that, that um, districts would need and uh, making everything available uh, for free so that everybody could kind of pitch in and, and solve this together. So once we knew that all of those people were on our side and could help us do this, then it was a matter of us sitting down and developing the plan. How are we going to make sure that we're getting ourselves compliant? How are we gonna make sure that we're both following the law and doing everything that we need to protect student data? Um, and, and through that process, we got plugged into an organization. I put a link to them on our slide there. Um, I can also put it in the chat. The organization was called Education Framework. And they, they kind of had just a, a, a great product at the right time to help us figure out, you know, A, the research of how vendors were managing student data, and then B, a platform for hosting the uh, vendors that we were working with and see they happen to have a great price and a, a super friendly, um, you know, uh, co-founder or founder and, you know, a guy running the program who every time, I, I mean, still, if I have a question at any point and, and email the company, he's the one to respond and, and help us, um, you know, get, our, get all of our ducks in a row and get everything kind of situated for us, everything from, you know, publicizing our agreements to, you know, researching the, the right companies and finding out if they have all the right, um, you know, uh, um, paperwork in order and privacy, you know, agreements in order, et cetera. So having them, uh, you know, be there for us was, was tremendously helpful. And then once we, you know, developed our plan as a district team, you know, we had to communicate that out to our district. Uh, interestingly, uh, in the midst of a pandemic, there was a little bit of a, um, this was a little bit of a positive of doing this in the midst of a pandemic was, okay, I'm about to communicate to our staff that, hey, I'm, I'm going to have to take away a lot of apps and vendors that you're used to using. Um, but, you know, obviously, normally that would be very bad news. But when you're dealing with, you know, quarantines and you're dealing with, you know, remote learning and you're dealing with all, you know, the, the challenges and difficulties that a pandemic brings, when you get an email from your, you know, one of your directors saying, 
you know, hey, I'm about to take away all these apps, it kind of falls to the, you know, to the wayside and people are like, okay, with all the other big things that I'm dealing with, this isn't the hugest thing uh, of all for me to deal with. So I kind of feel like that was a little bit of a silver lining to, to um, many of the challenges that were, we faced during the pandemic was this then didn't become the big thing that people were worried about. And then I'll just go back to, you know, we started out by saying to everybody, hey, you know, this is important. We need to protect student data. And wouldn't you want your own children's data protected? So when people came back, you know, with complaints, they were very few in number and very minor. And it was very easy for us to go back and say, okay, but if this organization isn't doing the, you know, uh, the best by students, then we can't use them. You do understand that, correct? And, and all very, you know, all very understanding of that. And then lastly, you know, we continue to maintain this plan, obviously moving forward. So as our district continues to try to innovate and to try to find ways to, you know, meet the needs of our teachers and students and parents and everybody involved in the education system, we want to maintain, you know, a, a, a strict adherence to student data privacy. And so we put a, a good plan in place of making sure that anytime somebody wants to use something, it gets, it gets checked. We, we make sure we're signing all the appropriate paperwork and posting it to all the appropriate places, but then going back and making sure that these you know, companies continue to maintain their uh, commitment to student data privacy because you know, they can change. And so we have to go back and, and make sure that we're, we're following up with them. Again, I added a couple of links at the bottom of how we house our approved applications and then how also our staff are able to find new resources that they can use and what our process is for approving them and making sure that, you know, again, we're dotting every I and crossing every T and making sure that uh, we're, we're protecting our students. Um, but really that was, you know, just a, a kind of snapshot of what the process looked like for us. And, and really on this side of it, I would say our staff has been super pleased with the way that this all worked out. Um, I'm very pleased with all the support we got from both, you know, uh, some folks in our state and also our local community and helping us to make this work. And um, yeah, I hope that was helpful and would always be happy to answer any questions if I could. Thank you, Pete. Um, I just like that you and true, every time I link with IT people, so my background is in educational technology and I love it when they're like, give me the steps. And so the fact that your slide was a checklist of like, <laughs> we need to do this, this, and this was spot on. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you for those practical steps. I went ahead and dumped two of the resources in the chat. Um, just in case anyone wants to go ahead and check them out. Um, so with that being said, we are going to transition to the panel discussion. I know a few of you have submitted some Q&As in the chat. If you haven't done so already, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Um, we have a wealth of knowledge and expertise, like I mentioned before, um, readily available to you all for about the next 20 minutes. So let's take advantage of it. Uh, we have Pete Helfers at, that just wrapped up on data privacy. We we have Matt Highfield, who is one of our Beaver 10 school district members and a member of the data equity cohort. We have Patrick McCreary. Yes, that is my goal to get everyone's name right tonight. Patrick McCreary, who is also at Beaverton School District. We have Aaron Mote, who is the co-founder and CEO of Project Unicorn. And we have Kylie Nevis. Make sure I got your name right. Kylie, who is um, with Oakland Unified School District. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, panelists, if you would go ahead and um, turn on your camera if you haven't done so already, just so our amazing audience can see you all. Um, and we're going to go ahead and start with a question that actually was presented to you, Kylie. I know you answered it in the chat, but let's answer it aloud um, since we're having this dialogue. The question is, how did you vet culturally appropriate tech support where the district employees, where the district, where, where they were district employees or foreign contractors? 
Yeah, so in terms of culturally appropriate tech support, I mean, we did a couple of things. So first we uh, created a family engagement subcommittee and that subcommittee worked explicitly with uh, community-based organizations as well as our founding partners, which included community-based organizations like um, Oakland Promise, um, the Open Education, uh, Public Education Fund, and other partners, Open Plan. A lot of people that are doing similar work, we wanted to align with their efforts as well. So uh, they were able to work with different communities uh, outside of the school district, outside of um, you know charter schools as well. And so in addition, we have that, um, the tech equity and access uh, team, and that worked across multiple departments within the district. They were able to work with families, um, able to identify what cultural supports were needed, what languages needed to be elevated as well. Mom was um, a definitely a, a, um, a population that we really need to, to serve, for example. It's not a written language, it is a spoken language only. So we actually had to work with community organizations that work with the mom population and create materials in mom uh, by working with translators, working with multilingual staff that we um, that you know that we hired um, for the campaign as well as those that already work in the district thank you for that kylie i love how you highlighted the need to bring in community engagement and community buy-in and community stakeholders and bring them into the conversation also before during and after the process so really highlighting that equity component um, the next one we have is for Pete. And this question asks, was support from a special interest group in data protection, such as the Student Data Privacy Consortium, um, did they assist in approving these ed tech vendors? So the way that they assisted was by, um, uh, in Illinois, anyway, this is how it works, that the agreement, the uh, National Data Privacy Agreement for Illinois was able to be signed by a district and then posted uh, freely and publicly to this um, site and then allowed all other districts to sign on to that uh, through what in Illinois, I guess it's national as well, but it's called the Exhibit E. So they, they hosted that for free for us and then made that available so that all participating districts could search and find those resources and then sign on to them. So without that, I, this would have been a, a hugely overwhelming task. So thank you for that, Pete. Um, the next question we have, Aaron, I'm going to call you to the front. Um, this question, I really believe, intersects with your work. I think it touches on everyone, but specifically with Project Unicorn. Um, how does data interoperability directly support data equity? That's a great question. I think... Um, we oftentimes, with the inability to bring our data together, actually can't even ask questions around equity. Um, we can't interrogate things if we can't bring our student ethnicity data together with our discipline data, whether or not we're suspending students at a higher rate if they're Black or Latino. Same with our uh, students with disabilities or our L population. We can't actually interrogate and ask important questions around equity, around discipline, behavior, access, if we're not able to actually understand and see that data side by side. And I think one of the other things that's really powerful besides the ability to interrogate your data and ask questions is the ability to activate partners. And I love that about the Oakland story because that sharing of data, that student information system, ARIES, that login information from Clever, that Google Classroom information, those are really distinct systems that all those providers didn't have access to. Only Oakland Unified and those charter schools had access to that data. And because they built trust, because they were able to bring that data together, they were able to action all these different components to frankly like do some pretty phenomenal work here. Going from 12% to 98% in a year is phenomenal. And so it's not just the ability to interrogate our data when we bring it together in a safe and secure way, but it's also the ability to empower others to take that data and action it for equity. 
Thank you for that, Erin. As you were speaking, what came to mind is some of the work I'm doing within the data equity cohort and how, you know, as their equity advisor, always having to circle back around with their um, folks who were hired specifically for data interoperability. And one thing that came to mind was like, looking at qualitative data versus quantitative data and how qualitative data can be really, really rich in conjunction with the quantitative data when addressing those equity gaps. Um, so thank you for that. With that being said, I'm gonna call upon Matt and Pat. I feel like every time I say you guys' name back to back, <laughs> I'm actually rhyming <laughs> during the webinar, but every time I say your names back to back, I try not to mess it up. Um, so specifically, can you all expand upon um, or really, really dive deep into what you guys were talking about in relationship to, or rather highlight the relationship between data equity and teacher bias? Sure thing. Um, Matt, I'll go ahead and start. And then as we do in the Matt and Pat show, feel free to, to chime in and, and help out if I miss anything. I think actually what um, we're, we're in an interesting place as a district in that we um, are, are, I'm going to call it our equity story. Our equity story has been one of kind of a grassroots initiative. Um, so we over the past, oh, 15, 10, 10 15 years have had kind of a a movement of a coalition of the interested and passionate to move forward with equity. Um, this team, um, one of the crowning achievements in my mind in this role that I serve in now was the co or collaborative development of an equity lens. So we have four questions that constantly um, guide our work. I'm gonna, it's on my badge right here. Whose voice is not isn't represented in this decision? Who does this decision benefit and bur benefit or burden? Is this decision in alignment with our BSD equity policy? And does the decision close or widen the access opportunity and expectation gaps? So we, we're in a place where we have a lot of the tools that were created, they just weren't necessarily being used widespread. So now we're at a point where equity is no longer a coalition of the willing, it's really the, the district vision. Our superintendent is on, has been on board saying, um, this is a priority that we need to emphasize use of our equity lens, that we need to make sure that that all of us as I'm going to use educators because it's not just about teachers. It's also our classified staff, our para educators, it's our administrators, that everybody is understanding the role that they play in their daily precise actions that either work towards greater equity for students or work towards inequity. And so a lot of our professional development right now is just focused on that, that individual self. So we are engaging in a lot of work around understanding implicit and unconscious bias, around knowing how to recognize it in ourselves knowing how to interrupt it and before it escalates. So a lot has been talked about. One, one of the pieces of data that we've had, um, we have currently and we've had for a long time is disproportionate data as it relates to discipline. So when we think about discipline data, instead of just looking at the data and saying it is what it is, we're asking teachers to look at the data to, to recognize and own the disproportionality in it, and then to think about how that data gets there. And, and what are the actions that lead up to it? And so really breaking it down to the very precise point of asking teachers to think about in those vulnerable decision points where, where um, behaviors may escalate or they can be de-escalated, what, what are we doing with regard to understanding our own positionality in those moments to help mitigate the likelihood that it will result in discipline? So we're, it's almost like we're, we're, we're trying to focus on work with our staff um, to prevent <laughs> to prevent the current data that we have from replicating itself. Yeah, thanks, Pat. I'll just add to that, you know, when we look at disproportionate discipline, I would say several years ago, uh, as an educator, I would just jump to a conclusion. Well, we obviously have some administrators who are, you know, um, disciplining in an, an unfair way. Uh, especially with our students of color, but that's that's just the surface level of the problem because you know administrator might say, well, we discipline the students that are coming to us, and maybe um, there are more students out in the hallways uh, that you know get this, um, they get written up and disciplined, and then you know so maybe it's the campus monitors who uh, you know need work, but then it's like, well, why are the students in the hallways? I mean, if 
if the classroom culture is um, so unwelcoming that students don't want to be in the classroom, then yeah, I, I would make sure that I was not in that classroom if, it, if a teacher wasn't being respectful to me or if I wasn't feeling included. So it really is, as Pat has mentioned, it's been uh, a journey for our district and we're still on that journey, um, but really to look at holistically at the problem and to, you know, to address all of, you know, all of the biases that, that we all have and, and how those impact students and how we, we can be better educators and create more inclusive classrooms and schools. Um, so, you know, it's one thing to look at the surface level of the data and go, oh, we have a problem, but just to really dig deep at all the different levels of, of you know, things we need to look at to be uh, more successful in what we're doing. Thank you for that, Matt. Aaron and Kylie, I know I saw you guys nodding throughout um, some of the key points Pat and Matt um, mentioned. Did you guys have anything else you wanted to add to that? We can perhaps start with Aaron and then Kylie, if you have anything else to add to that component. Once again, um, we were looking at the actual relationship between digital equity and teacher bias. So I would just add that I think Matt and Pat make really great points here about the interrogating the data and the onion that you have to unpeel when you're having these conversations that part of the work isn't just asking those surface level questions, it's peeling down those layers. And one thing I think is helpful um, in thinking about communication is that when we go to those conversations with actual data, sometimes that can help us de-stress. And instead of calling people out, we call people in with the data. And we say, we, we, we call them in to solve this problem with us. Instead of saying, you're doing this wrong, we start with questions. We ask with questions and we have this practice of, Again, saying, I'm not calling you out. I'm calling you into a conversation. And especially right now, I think dialogue discourse is really, really important. Being respectful in the way that we have these conversations is really important. And so I would just urge everyone to think about as you're looking at that data and asking those questions, how do I use that data to call someone into a conversation with me rather than call them out? So when I was thinking about, you know, teacher bias, and I, my first thought was, you know, how do we learn from teacher bias, right? And how do we learn from our own biases um, as we are doing large scale um, initiatives, you know, and just lessons learned. I mean, I think that, you know, even in the beginning of our campaign, uh, before we even got rolling, you know, there was some bias that just comes out of privilege or comes out of uh, experience that we actually had to tap into and identify and then re pivot, you know, and one of those is just with distribution. When we first thought about, you know, distributing devices, we thought ship to home, and that implies that everybody has a home to ship to, um, or, you know, that it's safe to ship to home, you know, and in a lot of cases, it was not, and we quickly, you know, you know convened our teachers to give us the input that we needed to see, okay, what would work for all students, for all demographics, for all of these situations. And the situations were across the board, you know, and making the assumption that just because your family makes a certain income that it's sufficient to, um, you know, do distance learning or that, you know, if you have a device that it's uh, sufficient to actually get on Zoom calls when you have another four other people in the household jumping onto the same, device. You know, we had a lot of uh, lessons learned, um, some of it in bias, some of it was just not understanding or not knowing the situations. And I think having those conversations with community members, with families, with students is imperative to make sure that the initiative is equity minded and you're really meeting the needs of all students. Ashley, could I add one thing that came to you mind? Sure, I can, Pat. <laughs> uh, and thank you, thank you, Aaron and Kylie, for what you added. Um, one of the things too that we're navigating, you know, there's a there's a beauty and a danger with using data. Um, the the danger is data can be used to tell a story, 
and it can be used to tell you know one of many stories so one of the things that we're trying to do as well when we use data in addition to that calling in to the conversation is to kind of constantly work to remind folks that our students are the data is not our students the data is more about us as a system and we need to we need to you know we're working on precise moves like using student first language not not talking about ELL students, but instead talking about students who are multilingual. Um, and so just getting, and again, that's incorporating that notion of always being mindful of our own potential biases. When we look at the data, that data does not describe our students. It describes what's happening to our students in our system because of our actions. And it's a, a key point that even in, in hearing Aaron say that, I'm reminding myself of that, that we need to articulate it regularly. Thank you for that, Pat. And actually, speaking of systems and how everything really works together um, to really achieve a common goal, there are two questions, maybe even three, if we could get through it, that I want to present to you all. And in the true spirit of equity, um, elevating equity of voice, I'm going to flip it to Pete. Um, and ask what are some of the key challenges with data privacy? So with this end goal in mind of achieving equity and access and making sure that our systems work together with data, with addressing data interoperability, what have been some of the, or what have you seen within your district have been some of the key challenges with data privacy? Yeah, I think I just want to start by really uh, applauding what Pat just said about, you know, the students are not our data. Um, the data is, tells more of the story about us. Um, and I think, you know, maybe this isn't the most crucial challenge, but, you know, anytime you go to solve a problem as large as this one, you have to keep people's focus on what's in the best interest of kids. And so I think, you know, once everybody got their mind to that place, and I know that it's not necessarily answering it from the equity standpoint, but in a district like ours, it kind of is because, you know, you want people to take everybody's data seriously, not just their own data seriously. And so um, I think maybe that was the biggest challenge, but it was also the one that was the most logically resolved that once you get people to a place of saying, look, isn't this what's in the best interest of you, of your children, of everybody's child? I think that is, is probably, um, you know, the one that was maybe the biggest, but also maybe the easiest to resolve, uh, but definitely tied to equity as well, especially um, in, in many districts who are serving, you know, many, many students from underserved populations. Thank you for that, um, Pete. And this actually is a question that is presented to all of you. Um, you all have mentioned the equity lens and actually how it's applied to multiple areas. Um, and one critique of the equity lens is that um, P districts are wanting to shift more towards equity mindedness so that unlike with the equity lens, sometimes it can be taken off and put on when the school leader or when the teacher or when the support staff member sees fit um, and really trying to change and adjust systems so that it supports an equity mindset. Um, what are your thoughts about that comparative, I guess, statement with the equity lens versus equity mindedness and how that plays out in all three levels. So data, equity, privacy, interoperability. And um, I will actually start with Kylie and then we'll go to Pat, Aaron, Matt, Pete. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, the equity lens versus the equity mindset, I think having the mindset is actually critical um, because having something that is opportunistic uh, doesn't really work for everybody. Um, so if it's something that you can take on, take off and use it at, you know, you know when it's convenient, isn't actually convenient. Um, so I think, you know, at, for Oakland uh, Unified, I know that we really um, have put in a lot of effort into our equity office of equity and our equity practices to shift over to a mindset um, with students at the forefront. So uh, I think that you know, in terms of you know, data interoperability, um, I think you know, it's, it was important. It wasn't just a lens that we were using. Um, it was really engaging with the community-based organizations as well um, to make sure that it was in our mindset 
um, when we were reaching out to those populations of students, when we were trying to, you know, do get to the hard to reach students, which was, um, you know, definitely their biggest challenge. But I think that, you know, with with the, having a lens, I think we would probably end up with more gaps. Was I next, Ashley? Yes, okay. I was trying to unmute myself still. You're up, Pat. Perfect. Um, I'm gonna actually try, I, yes to what Kylie said. I, I, that's essentially where we're at. You know, I, I referenced our equity lens questions earlier. And I, I look at it as the equity lens questions are the tool we're, we're using to get to that equity mindedness. It's almost like practicing over and over as a repetitive practice. Um, I was never, a, I'm not a sports person. I was never really on a team, but I imagine coaches are used to this. You, you do the same skill over and over to get better at it. So the way, the way I look at it, I mean, I, I was a little embarrassed that I didn't remember the four questions verbatim. I feel like I should know those. But I think that's a sign that like they're just ingrained in how I think um, that's where we want to get to. We want to get to the place where the equity lens isn't necessary because equity mindedness is in everything we do, but we're not there yet. And so I'm going to push the equity lens until we get there. Pat, I feel like you were in my head and you just <laughs> went ahead and regurgitated my thoughts. <laughs> All right, Aaron. Well, I get to plus on Kylie, plus on Pat. And I would say, um, you know, I think it's not just about mindset, it's about heart set. And I want to introduce the idea of heart set in, um, in this conversation. And that's because we're not going to be perfect. Um, this work is evolving. It's ongoing. There are moments where we are our best selves. Um, we, we adopt the mindset and we make the right choices and there's times when we need we need to be challenged by others we need to be uh, called in by others and so having both a mindset and a heart set that you are being called in not being called out is really really important and so whether you're tackling issues of privacy interoperability um or you know anything in sort of a data modernization um, piece. The other thing that I would just say is we're about to release a state of the sector report in just under 15 days in partnership with Edweek, which really for the first time will give, we hope the K-12 sector a snapshot of what is happening around interoperability and privacy. And here's what I want to share, that not all districts when we talk about equity, have the same resources to take on these questions. And we need to figure this out. Um, it can't be that our urban districts or our suburban districts have more resources than our rural districts. It can't be that equity is the purview of just districts that have over 3,000 students. We really, when we think about equity, need to interrogate how are we helping our low resourced districts come to the table? How do we call them into this movement um, and do so in a way that helps fundamentally change not just heart sets and mindsets, but actually change the way practice is happening every day in the classroom? I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. All right, Pete. So I, I, I just want to take a quick moment to give a uh, shout out to a, a league superintendent, uh, Marlon Stiles from Middletown, Ohio, um, because it was a conversation with him that I think helped our district uh, tremendously in developing this mindset. Um, we had a conversation at a league meeting a number of years ago and were asking some of these very questions and he recommended doing something through an organization called Think Tank which was a cost of poverty experience for our school district where every, per, every member of our school district and through volunteers in our community helped host a, um, a, a poverty experience for, for everybody to, to, um, to go through for an Institute day. And it was the last thing we did as a district before the pandemic. So this is on February 19th or something like that of 2020. And 
um, it had an, a, just an amazing impact on helping people understand just how important developing this mindset is for all the people that we serve and making sure that we don't take anything for granted and that everybody deserves the right to, you know, high quality education, high quality, you know, services, high quality, you know, all the way down to, you know, protection of, of their data. And it, I don't know, it, it was really just one of those great moments and in our district where I, where I look back and I realize this is really the type of work that we need to do and help people understand that everybody deserves the very best that we can offer. Um, and it takes work to get us there. Um, it's sad to say that, but it does. And, and it's important that those of us who are district leaders are willing to invest in that work. Thank you for that. Matt? Oh, it's hard, hard to follow up on all those great observations. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best. Uh, you know, I was thinking about what, what Pete said. I mean, equity is ongoing work and being able to, you know, lean into it or being called in. Um, for me, you know, what I've noticed is when district leaders and equity leaders, when they're called into a problem, their response, like if something's questioned in the system, their response is, is really telling. Um, if it's a matter of, of being defensive, like, well, we're doing all this and you know we're doing the best we can and why are you bringing this up versus, you know, let's explore that more. Um, I've, I've seen it happen both ways and um, you know, how all of us respond when um, you know, equity issues come up um, it is really important. And I, I was thinking about what both um, you know, Pete and Aaron said about rural and urban and suburban districts and, and resources and our students needing the best. One, one of the ways I've, I've seen it play out, at least years ago in our district, it's gotten a lot better, but you know, with the advent of technology and, and free platforms, uh, for a while, uh, several years ago, teachers were signing up for, for free tools and having their students sign up for free tools. And often when a student signs up for a tool, they would include, you know, a small piece of information about themselves that that company would use in a different way that teachers weren't thinking about. And um, of course, free tools are what some districts and some teachers that's all they have because they don't have those resources. So there's this kind of this tug of war going on between, um, you know, data privacy and opportunity gaps, and and you know they're fundamental to equity issues. So that's what I was thinking about when <laughs> you all were talking. But you guys, you guys, thank did you, a Matt. Great job. Um, definitely appreciate all of our panelists. Um, I am now going to, well, again, thank you for all of the expertise, all of the quick tips, links, resources. I see the chat um, going left and right with links and resources, which is what this panel discussion was here for. And so with that, I want to say thank you all and actually bring up Jenny from Digital Promise so that she can actually um, go over the Data Ready Playbook. Jenny? Hi, thank you, Ashley. And thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Um, I really, really appreciate you all sharing your stories. I really appreciate the work that you're doing and your deep commitment to your students and families and communities. Um, this equity work is hard and it takes that that strong commitment and that community approach. And so I just am in awe of you all and um, and so thankful to you for sharing your stories. I did want to, as um, Ashley mentioned, share one more resource with folks today. And I put this link in the chat, uh, but we at Digital Promise have created what we call our data ready playbook. And this is basically a soup to nuts um, introduction to getting started with data equity and data interoperability. So there is a diagnostic that districts can use to understand where to start in the playbook. 
And that diagnostic is used to personalize the activities that are recommended for your district. And so the playbook is comprised of 10 chapters, chock full of activities, resources, case studies, all designed to help you get from an awareness of data equity and interoperability to readiness to implement um, a project focused on using data to understand holistically what's happening with your students within your district and to hopefully address any existing inequities. So this is a free resource. We would love to have folks come visit, use it. Um, it's, it's here for the taking. So please take advantage. And uh, again, thank you so much to all of our panelists for your time and energy and stories today. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I am going to bring back my amazing co-host um, and shameless plug. Uh, I had the pleasure of working alongside Jenny and Apeksha, who's now on this call with the Daily Reddit Playbook. And it's a phenomenal resource. So please, please, please feel free to visit the link in the chat and check it out. Dwayne. All right, thank you, Ashley. Thank you so much. And thank you to the panelists. This has been a great conversation. At this time, I would now like to introduce a, a great Digital Promise colleague, uh, Ms. Sarah Meriting. She is with the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools. Sarah, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you for that great introduction. Um, just a quick uh, note that our Verizon Innovative Learning Schools program, we are now accepting applications for our ninth cohort. We've been doing this program for a while. It is a one-to-one -one initiative that offers really comprehensive um, professional learning for teachers to push for pedagogical shifts in schools. And this year we actually are launching two different models. We've got our tried and true one-to-one -one device model, which is really helpful, as well as a hotspot model um, for those districts that are already one-to-one, -one, but looking to close that um, connectivity gap at home. I'm gonna drop my um, website link in the chat because I know that we're reaching time. So I'll just share that and feel free to reach out to me if you have any um, questions about our program and applying. Thank you, Sarah. Please, please, please sign up for the Verizon Innovative Learning School. Sarah, how much does this cost districts? Zero dollars. Zero dollars. Totally free, right? And Dwayne, you and I both came from Verizon Innovative Learning School yes. district, right? So we can speak firsthand to the work that, that's happening in those schools. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you to the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools. All right, Ashley, we are wrapping up. We are at an end. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for coming. And I would like to also thank you, Ashley, uh, for doing this uh, co-moderating with me. Good to see <laughs> my old colleague again. Yes. Uh, so uh, I think this was a great conversation. Um, and for those districts who are, you know, we always say this, a lot of our districts are data rich and, and implementation poor. Hopefully this conversation helped you really think about how to utilize your data in a meaningful way and how do you reach the most marginalized students in your districts. Like I, I was I was blown away by the information. Same here, Dwayne. And so if you guys didn't click on the links in the chat, please feel free to visit the Digital Promise website. They actually have their Data Ready Playbook information on the League of Innovative Schools. Um, Dwayne, I am a little sad that we don't work together um, on the day-to-day -day anymore, but you're doing phenomenal work with the League of Innovative Schools, and I'm happy to co-moderate this panel discussion with you. So um, with that being said, if there's nothing else, Thank you all and have an amazing night. Thank you, everyone, and continue to do right by students.